Good morning. morning. Great to see all of you here today. Uh, For those that are not located on Longboat Key, we are in the middle of a massive rainstorm. So this is fantastic. I'm enjoying it. So um, I'm hoping that the thunder will be able to accentuate our prayers today as we pray. So welcome. I'm glad you're all here. And as they say in North Idaho, um, as long as the creek don't rise, and it didn't. So you're here. So welcome. Our service begins on page two in your bulletin. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, Let us confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all our sins through Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and and our our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, Come, let let us us adore adore him. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great This morning is Psalm 145, verses 8 to 15. It can be found in your bulletin and in your prayer books on page 802. Let us read it responsively by half verse. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone. And his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord. And your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom. And speak of your power. 
that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his words. And merciful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all, who, all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. Glory, Glory to the to Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome. There is a conflict in the Roman church about following the law of Moses, Roman law, and following Christ. Paul asserts that death nullifies the law, like in marriage, and as such, Jesus' death canceled the law for his followers because we die in our baptism to be raised by Christ. Nevertheless, Paul wrestles with the force of sin inside his body that makes him sin and will sentence him to death. The life of Christ shows Paul what to do, but because of his internal sin, he is unable to accomplish what is good. Paul, therefore, depends upon God's grace, not his own fortitude, to do what is right. We know that the Mosaic law is spiritual, but I've made of flesh and blood, and I'm sold as, as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the things that I hate. But if I'm doing the things, the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm, do, I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages a war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God, though, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's law in my body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Matthew. Jesus said, To what will I compare this generation? It is like a child sitting in the marketplaces calling out to others. We played the flute for you, and you don't, didn't dance. We sang a funeral song, and you didn't mourn. For John the baptizer came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. Yet the human one came eating and drinking, and they said, look, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. Then he began to scold the cities where he had done his greatest miracles because they didn't change their hearts and lives. How terrible will it be to you, Chorazin? How terrible will it be to you, Bethsaida? For, you, for if the miracles done among you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, then they would have changed their hearts and their lives and put on funeral clothes and ashes a long time ago. But I say to you that Tyre and Sidon will, better, will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you, Capernaum, will you be honored by being raised up to heaven? 
No, you will be thrown down to the place of the dead. After all, if the miracles that were done among you have been done in Sodom, it would still be here today. But I say to you that it will be better for the land of Sodom on judgment day than it will be for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have shown them to be babies. Indeed, Father, this brings you happiness. My Father has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to anyone whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads. I will give you rest. I have put on my yoke, put on my yoke and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Happy Independence Day weekend. Thanks. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but it's nice. It's uh, uh, Today is the 5th of July, and did you all have a good 4th? Yeah. Was it different than times you've had or what you had expected? Yes. Uh, as you know, we were planning to go out and watch fireworks on our boat, but there were no such fireworks, so we put fireworks at our house out on our street. And I'm happy to report that I have all 10 of my fingers. There have been no burns or anything like that. Uh, we have a few action figures that have been disfigured thanks to various smoke balls and other things that we attached to them. Uh, but other than that, everything's great. So it's interesting for those putting together the revised common lectionary that these are the readings that are always on the first Sunday of July. And the first Sunday of July is around the 4th of July. And I think they have a bit of a sense of humor because the readings today all show dependence upon God. So as we are celebrating Independence Day, you come to church and you hear about dependence. And there is hardly anything that is harder to preach about to an American audience than dependence. Independence, now that preaches, but dependence is difficult. So we're going to walk down this difficult road and we're going to do it using Paul as our guide. So St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter to the church in Rome called Romans. And as we've discussed before, that church had a conflict going on. And the conflict, the primary source of that conflict was you had two different types of people in the church. You had those who were raised Jewish and part of the Jewish faith and life, and they have come to understand that Jesus is their Messiah. And they use many of the spiritual practices that their parents and their grandparents taught them, along with believing Jesus is the Messiah. The other group are folks that were raised pagan, and their parents taught them the pagan rites and rituals and all the different types of gods that are out there. And when they came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they also came to believe that there's one God. And so they got rid of all their statues, they got rid of all of their emblems and other things that were in their house. They got rid of sacrificing to various gods. Some of them had to get rid of their jobs because their jobs had to do with the cult of a particular god uh, of one way or another. And so they got rid of all that stuff and then they were baptized and became a part of the way, which is what Christianity was called, the way. And so they would look at their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ and say, we gave up all of our stuff to become baptized. Why don't you give up all of your stuff? And the people that had been raised in the Jewish faith and life would say, you just need to become Jewish, and then you can become a part of the movement. And so there was this massive conflict. And for some unknown reason, Paul decided to write chapter 7, which is some of the stickiest stuff 
that has to do with how the church was trying to operate. And it came down to taxes. And you might say, I didn't see anything in today's reading about taxes. He didn't have to say it because it was a part of what was happening. That people that were a part of the Jewish faith and life were excluded from paying particular taxes. And so there were many that the tax collectors would say, this family became Jewish just to avoid paying taxes, right? And so when they see people joining the church, they think that they are trying to get out of particular taxation. So that's one issue. Another issue is around the law itself. So do they have to listen to all of the Mosaic law and to do all of the law? Or do they follow what Jesus said, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength? And the second, say it with me if you know it, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So they were saying, but that's our law. Everything else falls short, and so we are to do this. And then you've got Roman law. There were people that became baptized and then believed that they didn't have to follow any of the Roman laws. And so in that, there are these various groups in one church all arguing with each other. And by the way, taxes were a part of it. Now, this is starting to sound American, right? <laughs> okay, good. So yes, here we are. Is that, wait, is that 2020? That we're arguing about rights and privileges and taxes? And, it's interesting to me. So, in all of that, Paul didn't have to go into chapter 7, but he did. He wanted to talk about the law, and he did it differently than how he was trained to do it. So, Paul is from Tarsus, and Tarsus is where you would send all those that want to be emperors, all of those who want to be um, education, university professors, uh, great philosophers, all of those people head to Tarsus to learn. And this is where Paul was educated. And so he was taught in a way of argument. And what you never do in argument back then is you never use the ego statement, uh, ego, which means I, the I statement. You never do that. You set up one particular argument here, you set up another argument here, and then you use this argument to attack that argument. And Paul, for some strange reason, deciding to talk about the law, opened up the conversation by using I. This is radical for those days. If you imagine in uh, your time in college, turning in a paper that said, I think, what would your professor tell you, right? I don't care what you think. I want to know what these people had to say about this particular topic. And so here he is leading with I. And not only that, he's not saying, I'm the greatest and I'm the best and just follow me. He's saying, I'm the worst, that I know what's right, and yet inside of me, I do what's wrong. I hate evil, yet I do evil. I love good, yet I do bad. And there's nothing I can do about it. What a miserable man I am, is how he ends this phrase. The older translation, what a wretched man I am, right? That's how Paul is putting his argument out there. I can't do it. I know what's right. I do what's wrong. I don't want to do what's wrong. I want to do what's right, and I can't do it. What he is saying is that he can't do good without the grace of God. That without, well, apart from the grace of God, he is unable to do anything that is good. Yesterday we celebrated Independence Day and the declaration, the signing of the Declaration of Independence and being independent from the king, independent from the crown, independent from England. And by saying these things, writing them and signing it, at the same time they are declaring independence, the founding fathers as they were called, signed up for dependence on two things. Number one, the framers believed that we are dependent upon the providence of God. 
We cannot succeed or live as 13 independent states. We cannot go to war against the greatest empire ever fashioned on the face of the earth unless by God's providence. We can't do this on our own. We depend upon God. Number two, we depend on the character of our neighbors. We depend upon the character of those who will be forming this nation, of those who will be putting together sound industry, of those who will be running the pinching presses and talking and publishing papers. We depend upon the ethics and what we would call Christian values of the American citizenry. Without that, without the providence of God, we're sunk. And so that's where we are today, understanding about how our nation was formed, how we relied upon the providence of God, of uh, these good things, and how we relied on uh, the ethics and the character of the citizenry. Not much further in time past that declaration did the framers talk about the importance of the fourth estate the fourth estate, what we would call the media. The uh, free, unregulated media to be able to investigate, to report, and to give out facts, as boring as they might be, but to do that. That we are dependent upon the province of God, upon the, uh, the values of all humans in this country, and upon the fourth estate. And they then went on to say, and we are, at, uh, we are dependent upon an educated citizenry. And that was the birthplace of our public education system. And so after we declared independence, we started to then declare to what we are dependent. We're dependent on each other, on education, on our free press. We're dependent upon uh, characters and values and the providence of God. So then we've got this Matthew reading. And to, to share something brief with you is that um, the, the middle part where Jesus began to scold the cities and he ends with, it would be better for you and the land of Sodom on the judgment day than it will be for you. Um, the people that put the lectionary together excluded that paragraph. And I have this really weird nature of whenever I see in the lectionary they've excluded something, I always go there first. I wonder, well, what did you leave out? Did you do that too, Reverend Maggie? Yeah, it's, I, I wanna know, what, what are you leaving out? And what was left out was this, what some, my mentor had said, the revised common lectionary likes to cut out the cranky Jesus. <laughs> the one who gets a little angry, and gets a little cranky at things. And so, if I had done miracles for you, and you don't follow, It'll be better for the land of Sodom on Judgment Day than it will be for you. But I think there's more to this, and that's why I put it in. And that is going back to the law. Roman law was instituted at the tip of a sword, at the boot of a soldier. That Roman law and following and adhering to it was instituted by the power of the empire. It was through taxation, and it was through uh, military might. It was also through crucifixion. That is how they instituted their laws. And if you didn't like it, you literally got strung up on a tree and everybody got to see it. Mosaic law. The way that it played out in Paul's day is that those who weren't following, those are part of the Jewish faith and life, that were not following the, uh, the law were labeled unclean and unclean people were cut out from participating in society. Some unclean people were cut out from purchasing things in the marketplace. They were excluded from being in synagogue and, and learning and, and uh, worshiping that way. And so there was this compulsory sense of these two forms of law that you had to do it. And then in comes the law of Christ. God didn't force anybody to do this. So when Jesus is talking to the cities, 
And he's saying, I performed miracles for you, and you didn't respond. It's like children that bring out their flutes and their drums, and they would go out on a, a day in the marketplace, and they would gather together, and they would sing songs, they would play songs, and they would bang on their drums, and people would come by, and they would dance with the kids, and they sometimes would leave money for the children. And Jesus is saying, it's, it's, it's like we're children and playing music, and none of y'all danced. And then he goes further, that they would take a funeral procession, and to lead the funeral procession through the village or through the town, they often would have children leading, either playing musical instruments or singing. And you all remember the black and white picture of John F. Kennedy Jr. as he's saluting as the coffin of his father goes by? Thinking of that image and not feeling emotional? What Jesus is saying is that I had children, it's like children leading a processional of someone who died and nobody got sad. The children can't force the adults to feel sad on the day of a funeral. The children can't force adults to dance when they play happy songs. Jesus can't and will not force us to love God and to love our neighbor. It is an invitation. And how frustrating it must be to have the power of the universe and to have people turn away, knowing that they're not going to be forced, not the way that Roman law would force, not the way that Mosaic law was enforced. It was an invitation. With that invitation, Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, you that are worn out, broken down, washed out. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That phrase is to mean not that when you follow Jesus, you have no yoke, you have no burdens, you have no responsibilities. Mm -mm. I'm going to take that yoke off of you and I'm going to give you mine. Mine is easier for you to carry because as Jesus said, you and I are going to carry these burdens together. Cast your anxieties upon me. Cast your fears upon me. Let me carry them, says Jesus. Yet he sees these cities who reject him and carry their heavy burdens. Paul carried those heavy burdens. He tried to do what is right and he failed. It was too heavy for him to carry. He ends this passage with, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God who carries burdens for us. The yoke that I carry often is a yoke of worry, of anxiety, and of fear. That's what I like to put in my buckets and have across my shoulders. That's what I carry. And I often think that the more that I do for God, the more that I get to put in my buckets, the more anxiety and fear I get to carry. Mm -mm. What a wretched man I am. No way. I can't carry that on my own. Constantly reminding myself to give these things to God, that Jesus wants to carry our burdens. He wants to lift these things from our shoulders. And how sad he is when he sees people out on their own trying to carry their own burdens. Jesus won't force us to do these things. He's inviting us to follow him. The framers could not force the hand of God or the providence of God to support the independent states. They couldn't force the citizenry into what we now call the social contract of taking care of each other, making sound government, sound industry, sound finance. Couldn't be forced. It was an encouragement, it was a calling, saying we're gonna do things differently from now on. We're going to be a nation that's gonna shine for others to see. We're going to try something new. We're gonna throw off the yoke of the strength of the crown and we are going to put on the yoke of self-governance. 
And we can do that through a free fourth estate. We can do that through education of all citizens. We can do that, all pulling together. And yesterday, we celebrated the 244th celebration. And we ponder, are we doing it? Are we there yet? No, we're not. But we're, we're making progress. We are heading. We are heading in that direction. And we are still dependent upon God's providence. We are still dependent upon one another. And as our face masks show us today, we are dependent upon the health of our neighbor. As we declare our independence, we start to see just how dependent, interdependent we are on one another and upon God. If you're carrying burdens that you're tired of holding, Jesus is calling out to each and every one of us, saying, come to me. Take my yoke upon me on you. Give me your burdens. Cast your anxieties upon me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. <clears throat> Create in us clean hearts, O God. <clears throat> Almighty God, who hast given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom 
those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, you proclaim your truth in every age by many voices. Direct in our time, we pray, those who speak where many listen and write what many read, that they may do their part in making the heart of this people wise, its mind sound, and its will righteous, to the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. We pray for those who are sick, those who suffer. We pray for all who protect us both here and abroad and for all healthcare workers. We pray for those on our prayer list especially Downs the Fourth, Holden, Heidi, and Cynthia. We pray for all who are in skilled nursing, especially Ruth, Timothy, Dawn, and Barbara. We pray for all who are in hospice care, especially Ward. We pray for healing and recovery for Susan, John, and Tom. We pray for those going through cancer treatments, especially Victoria, Andres, and Ginny. We pray that the Holy Spirit comfort those who cannot visit their loved ones and for those who cannot be visited. And we pray that the wisdom and love of the Holy Spirit descend upon those who care for the sick. We pray for those we name now, either silently or aloud. Daisy and her family. We pray for those who have died and for all who mourn, especially those we name now. Bring us the living bread that is broken and shared for the world. Lord God, help us find peace in you. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A prayer for spiritual communion. Together, let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in union with the faithful gathered around the world today, I offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and particularly for the blessings given me that I name now. I believe that you are present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot receive communion at this time, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. In the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom in me, in my family, and in my community. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart. Guide me along the right pathways and conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep my heart and mind in the knowledge and the love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with me now and always. Amen. Greetings and announcements. Thank you for coming out today. And the rain has ended. I am still wet from running around out there, and as I imagine you are too, but I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for worshiping, and thank you for those uh, around the globe who are participating as well. Uh, we have this week, uh, Monday, the office is closed in, in, in celebration of Independence Day, and um, I think that means that Lynn will be celebrating uh, independence with various plants, and the marshals might be out on the boat, but based on today's weather, Probably not, so <laughs> we'll see. And based on today's weather, maybe you won't be gardening either, Lynn. I don't know, who knows? But, uh, and then Tuesday we have our men's group and Thursday we have our women's group. Uh, the reading will be coming out today and be looking in your emails for that. Uh, the need for food is real in our community and so our yellow bucket is waiting outside. We have an upgraded bucket. I don't know if you noticed this, Reverend Maggie. It's an upgraded bucket now. It has a lid so it can keep things dry. And speaking of upgrading, uh, we have our uh, take a puzzle, leave a puzzle. That too has been upgraded to a plastic bin with a lid to protect it from uh, the summer rainy season that is upon us. So uh, also, uh, our, as you may have seen, our offertory plates are out. And for those watching online, if you go to our website, you will find a Donate Now. Uh, we are completely dependent upon the generosity of all of those who call all angels their spiritual home. So thank you for all that you do. Uh, special thanks to our uh, women who put together the flowers for each week, and especially today. Uh, I smiled when I came in to see these. They are beautiful, so thank you for that. Um, and a special thanks to CJ and Katsy for wearing all red, white, and blue. I appreciate that. That is wonderful. Uh, for those that can't see, CJ is wearing red pants. It is, that is great. So, <laughs> and white socks, okay, good. And a white shirt, blue tie, blue jacket. It is wonderful, thank you. So for our closing hymn, uh, for those that are um, call England home, you may recognize the tune that um, some good Church of England that then became uh, Episcopalians rewrote uh, this beautiful hymn for America. So we will have God Bless Our Native Land with these verses printed.
Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.